it's my great pleasure to introduce on our far end Michael Rodriguez. Uh, Michael uh, is an associate professor here in educational psychology who specializes in measurement. Uh, he's the go-to guy on measurement on campus for a whole variety of different areas, including achievement tests. Uh, last January, January, he was appointed to a new position devoted to addressing the achievement gap, the Campbell Leadership Chair in Education and Human Development. Uh, and in this role, he supports ongoing work to reduce the gap, expands the university-wide collaboration, uh, and advises President Kaler in the best ways to improve educational access and success. We're delighted to have Michael here. And Michael also, I should say, is on the task force, uh, Generation X task force on social emotional learning and the Generation X data task force or data committee on how to use data in our communities more wisely. And next to him is Reverend Brenda Gerton Mitchell, uh, who is the director of the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, something I learned uh, just yesterday from you was that there are 13 different departments that have centers for faith-based and, and uh, uh, neighborhood partnerships uh, in addition to the White House one. Uh, and she was commenting on the number of bosses she has. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the, we're glad to have you both here. Uh, so I will turn to Michael first and just uh, we're going to ask each of the panelists to reflect uh, and then we will go to the Q&A that from the questions you pose and some others. Michael? Thank you, thank you, Dale. Uh, and I do wanna thank Kim and Dale for the invitation. They came to me a few months ago and said, <clears throat> we're gonna do this thing over at the stadium and we're gonna have a couple speakers and we'd like you to comment. And I said, sure, I can, I'm from Minnesota, I can comment on anything. <laughs> uh, and actually, uh, I'm fifth generation Minnesotan and fourth generation and current resident of the great city of St. Paul. Uh, <clears throat> Wow. <laughs> uh, I am honored to have this, this uh, Campbell Leadership Chair. Uh, it's funded by Jim and Carmen Campbell, who are great Minnesotans, graduates of the University of Minnesota, great supporters of the system, but also important supporters of education. And they saw the achievement gap as an area that they wanted to contribute to, knowing that there's lots going on at the university. Uh, problem is everybody's sort of doing their own thing out on their own and so we're trying to uh, get folks a little bit organized here uh, and I have been uh, very fortunate to work on related topics with uh, early learning early literacy which is one of my areas of measurement work and also social emotional learning uh, which is another area where I've been able to do some measurement work uh, just as context I've been working with the state in developing the early learning uh, assessment system uh, and there are early learning standards in the state of Minnesota of which social emotional learning and preparedness is a part. Uh, I've had a chance to do lots of work with the Search Institute uh, and their focus on assets and social emotional learning now turning into the importance of developmental relationships and perseverance. Uh, I also had opportunities and, and currently work with the US De Defense Department uh, because they are also very interested in the social and emotional preparedness for military life. Uh, so in all of these contexts, it's, it's about uh, preparedness and guidance and support so that people find a way to fit and make systems work, uh, but also make sure that individuals work in conjunction with systems that all assume the social emotional level of preparedness from cradle to career is quite important. So let me just make a couple quick comments uh, since I'm here to comment on, on the speakers uh, and, and their presentation, which I greatly appreciated. Uh, the one common component that I really appreciated is the idea of the whole child, uh, which is really key. And, and with Gil, the, the holistic approach uh, was really important. It, it actually reminded me of my own development as a, as a kid growing up on the east side of St. Paul. And I hadn't thought about this for a long time until uh, the two speakers spoke, and, and because of our next, our next commenter, um, when I was tired of just being a rug rat running around with my buddies on the Lower East Side of St. Paul, we went to the Salvation Army. Uh, the Salvation Army on Payne Avenue had programs for youth, and we would go and we'd roller skate in their basement, we'd go on fishing trips, we'd go do campfires, and we'd sing Kumbaya. <laughs> and, the thing is, is for some kids, kumbaya works. 
And for some kids, they need the kumbaya. And so this is an important point because both of the speakers address this issue of context matters. And, and it's gonna take lots of efforts to meet the needs and interests of lots of kids and, and preferences and tailoring. And we need to think about tailoring after school just as much as we ask teachers to tailor and differentiate in school. Uh, the holistic student assessment is a way, I think, to figure that out, to figure out the tailoring piece. Uh, and to focus on what we do, which I really appreciate because in all the work that I do in measurement and in teaching about measurement, Measurement has to be driven by the need to know. If we don't need to know, we certainly shouldn't be doing measurement. Uh, there are two things that Gil mentioned that I, I want to address and, and maybe put forth a little bit of a challenge. I've got a challenge for both of the, the speakers with respect to the measurement piece. Uh, and one is the, the assessment is norm-referenced assessment. Uh, there are lots of norm reference assessments, and for lots of purposes, it's important to know how are our kids doing compared to other kids, or how kids in this school or this neighborhood doing compared to other kids. Those are, those are uh, important things to know. But I wonder about the possibility of criterion reference scoring, uh, so that it's not relative to how other kids are doing, but it's maybe a statement of the community in terms of how we want our kids to be doing. So let me give you an example. One of the components is relationships. Well, we know that far too few kids have meaningful, appropriate, productive relationships with adults. So the norm on relationships is not where it needs to be. So we might say kids in our neighborhood are pretty close to the norm of, of other kids. But when the norm is not where it needs to be, that's not where we want our kids. And so the criterion reference component, I think, is something that could be useful for other purposes. Uh, and then I just want to make a, a quick comment on, you, you mentioned this idea of thinking about stages developmentally. And I, I really appreciated that. It actually helped me solve a, a conundrum that I've been thinking about, too. Because if we think about the importance of different stages along the developmental trajectory, it gives us reason to ignore the other stages because they all matter and they're all at play. Some are more prominent at certain times than others. But if every component, oops, I, I was timing myself to keep myself under, <laughs> under. <clears throat> I'm a measurement guy, so. <laughs> <laughs> But if, if, if we believe every component matters, then we have to attend to every component at, at all times. And so I really appreciated that, that piece. And, and for Kim, uh, fellow psychometrician, uh, Kim and I just realized we have a very, we have a common dear friend and, and colleague. Uh, the psychometric world is, is small, so it was just a matter of time, I think, before we actually met. Your focus on thriving, uh, I think, is interesting. The idea that context matters, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is important. And so here's a, here's a challenge for you in thinking about this. You made the claim that the number of assets matters. This is something that Search Institute has also been saying, but we've all wondered, is it really just the number of assets? Or is there a certain combination of assets that's more important than others? Is there a gateway asset that as long as this asset is developed, other assets will come with it? Uh, and what about the cultural variations? in the combinations of assets, right, that are really important because we know there are many pathways to thriving and many pathways to success. I'm reminded of a, a very short uh, study. Latino kindergarten children come into the classroom with very rich social skills. And somehow we're not, we're not able to <clears throat> capture those social skills to support their academic development. Uh, and so the combination of assets in different communities and different pathways to success, I think, is something that you probably do uh, address and, and are challenged with. And then finally, the, the issue about context, because I'm, I'm convinced that context matters. How does context play a role in determining thriving? And is thriving context specific? Can a kid thrive at school but not at home? Can a kid thrive at home but not at school? And, and this, I, this I often wonder, it's, it's not quite as stark as that, but, but this is the idea, if context really matters, then how do we play, how do we use context to inform us about whether kids are thriving or not? Thank you, Michael. Yeah. 
I will give each of the panelists a chance after uh, the next commentary to, to respond to the challenges and stuff or comments, I think so. But, Reverend Brenda? Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Are we on? Yep. Okay. I, I wanted to talk about a few things that this conversation yesterday and today made me think about in creating a greater awareness of the social emotional learning or social emotional development, whichever terms we choose to use. And they were not things that I expected to think about. But if we talk about why we're concerned about this for our children, and my quote of the day is that we're, we're always learning. Um, one of the speakers you, you this morning said, you know, we never, we never finish the process of growing up. And so how do we take what we're learning in this field and do some forward thinking even about what a job application has to look like in the future? Even about the kind of ladders of opportunity that we need to create to balance the achievement gap. We're trying to stop talking about the achievement gap and talk about the ladders of opportunity. And so what popped in my head this morning was when, when I first had to apply for this government work, this is a crazy application. Anybody working the government, <laughs> seeing those applications, USA Jobs? So they didn't want to know as much about what I had done as about the KSAs the knowledge, skills, and abilities. And I would dare say, if I go back and look at that after these last two days of, of learning, that the things that they need to add under skills and appreciate are the elements that we've been discussing, the assets we've been discussing the last few days. So when we're working with children, and I taught elementary school for 10 years, I'm active with youth ministry and have been for years at, at my church and in other places. The, the, categor, the, the categorization usually is, well, you have good people skills or you don't. It's like nothing in between. You know, you know how to get along with people or you don't know how to get along with people. So the awareness that this creates is gives, gives us some useful language that can be used across the various areas of our lives, not only to help the young people that we're working with, but to help us. There's a, a book that we studied a couple of years ago called The Five Love Languages. And that was the other thing that came to my mind that wouldn't necessarily feel like it fits. But in The Five Love Languages, he talks about relationships and understanding what you need from other people and what they need from you. So this is sort of the social and emotional learning about what our love language is, and what the child's love language is, that young person's love language. What do they need to feel affirmed and protected and cared about, uh, to have their gifts valued, and to recognize that no matter what their style is, if you will, that there's a place for them and somebody who's going to support them in that work. And so I, I guess my challenge, if any, is that we continue to find some everyday language for folks who don't know the research, who may not have quite the lofty language to use, but need to, that are using the skills and need to see how they're relevant in the lives of, of all of our children. And uh, the, the last thing I'll say is that very often as adults, adult leaders, we are not using our own life experiences. I appreciate the story that you shared, our own stories to help us understand how to connect with people. Very often we hide our story or we don't think it's relevant anymore, but that's where our context comes from. And um, the, the, the story is told about the young woman who, you know, she's cooking, she's a new wife and she's cooking this roast beef and she took the pan out and she cut the end off of it. And her husband says, why are you throwing away that piece of meat? Why are you cutting that off? And she says, I don't know, it's just what you're supposed to do. My mother always did it. She asked her mother, Mom, why did you cut the end off of the roast beef? And she says, I don't, you know, that's the way you do it. That's what my mother always did. So they said, well, go ask Grandma. She asked Grandma. She says, I didn't have a pan that was big enough. <laughs> and so we do learn things just by watching people do them and may not be aware of why. And sessions like this give us some language to use to describe some of the behaviors that we've adopted. So thank you for the very valuable teaching and the opportunity to 
talk about this in everyday ways that will help all of us do a better job for ourselves and the children that are in our midst. Thank you. Um, uh, either of you want to comment or you want to go to the questions? Well, maybe a, 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 I'd love to do both. <laughs> <laughs> and but, you will. <laughs> um, so, and Kim, I saw you writing down something, so you yeah. probably want to say something. I, I mean, I, I can keep this very short. First of all, Michael and Brenda, thank you for really great comments. I mean, really, it's, it's rare that you're in the presence of two people who, from the very different perspectives, get to the same place. One very kind of numbers and statistics oriented, and the other person from a kind of faith-based perspective, and, and both of them are really saying some very similar things. And I think they go to the, to the core, which is somehow story versus numbers, right? Or why are we so complicated about this? Didn't really the people who got it three generations ago, didn't they do the right things then? And don't we just have to learn from them again and become reasonable in the face of so many things, so many struggles that we have? And I, so that's one perspective. The other perspective is evidence, evidence, evidence. Have you heard that term? Evidence-based, evidence this, evidence that, numbers, numbers driven. So how do we make, how do we get that together? That's really the issue. And I think that um, one of the biggest problems, and where I start from, just to, and I think Kim also, is not the question of is it better to have reasonable approaches versus numbers. It's more like the numbers are here to stay. In other words, if we don't do something to get hold of that enterprise, we're going to be told, like in schools, what the outcomes are supposed to be. Because out outcomes driven is here to stay. And so that's why I think we have to kind of translate the stories and the way we know kids develop and transform that into some numbers that can actually help us make our case. A lot of it has to do with making our case in order to keep the funding coming. Some of it is knowing the kids, but a lot of it has to do with using numbers in a wise way. I, I'll respond to, to Michael's comments a little later because he, he made some really great comments also about the specifics. But I want to be sure that Kim has time. And I just, um, so I want to also again thank Michael and Brenda. That was amazing to be able to have commentators just to reiterate what Gil said in terms of, you know, that really get it, that sort of could comment at that level. Um, and it just, I love the conversation. Um, the one thing I, I do want to say, so the, the MDI and the way it was developed was about the idea of how context really matters and how to give people tools in which they can start looking at what's happening in their context and what they can do about it. And to get to two things, so first of all, there's these five assets, we call them, and is there one that, is there sort of the uber asset? And I would actually argue yes. I mean, we have some data, we've done analyses across this looking at trajectories, and I would say the number one is the connectedness, the relationships, that they are kind of the bedrock of, you know, besides the nutrition and sleep and the after school time and stuff, it seems because the, the relationships run throughout all of those. And so the relationships are really the key. And I know the Search Institute now is really focusing on this issue of developmental relationships. So I, I talked to them yesterday. I was like, yes, that's, that's the way to go. Um, so that was, and then the cultural variation is a very interesting one. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't address that in how we're doing our maps and things like that, but of course we're looking at that idea. And I wanted to, I wouldn't just give you one example. So for example, in Vancouver, we have a large South Asian population. We have very much diversity, you know, as I said, 130 languages represented all different parts of the city, but a large South Asian population. And the kids who uh, live in those homes, often there's extended family all living together. There's the grandmas and who are there and you know we talk about constructive use of after school time as being the asset you know if you're doing programs if you're not going right home because we find a lot of kids do go home they're on the computer but in some cultural uh, ba families that in fact going home and being with your your grandparents being with your siblings and doing that that is just as 
asset building, well-being building, as is ch other children who might be in after-school activities. So I think that that idea that um, one size fits all, we, that's not at all what I wanted to say. We really have to see is how different things make a different in depending on children's own backgrounds and stuff. So I think that that, it really, it's a critical, critical issue. Um, we've had a number of questions. Uh, just very briefly, uh, questions around the cost and access for each of you. What is, how do you access the tools you were talking about? And very briefly, again, something on cost or something. So, so the MDI is relatively new. It is, um, we just did our first pilot in 2010 in, in BC, and it's now, as you saw, 23 school districts. Um, we do have funding from, because the entire province is, is useful data. We have funding from United Way of the Lower Mainland, and so they actually fund a lot. Um, they provide a lot of funding, and then school districts pay, um, at, but school districts with communities. So for example, some, some school districts work with their city planning, and they actually get money from city planning, go to their, uh, their, community, plan, their community thing, and the school district in combination. Now as far as cost, it's, it's kind of a per student because basically, oh, I wanted to make one comment. We do these reports, and so kids do the MDI in November, December, November, and we make sure that all of the schools and communities get the reports by April, so that they can use them in their school planning. And I don't know if you have accountability contracts or things that you have to do. So we really make it doable for that. And and the cost, like I don't know, I want to say a cost for a larger district for like you know with a few thousand, like say Vancouver with three thousand students, that they get the individual school reports plus the community reports plus all the maps and things is about fifteen thousand, seventeen thousand dollars. A really small district with uh, could be as low as two or three thousand dollars. So thank you, Gil. Um, I just want to respond to one thing that came up in the small groups that connects to this, which is, you know, it makes me a little uncomfortable sitting up here with Kim and kind of saying, like, okay, my, my measure costs <laughs> this much and your measure costs that much. I mean, because it, part of the issue is, I think we need both. I mean, I, I don't want us to get into this thing, we need community data, we need individual data, and now we have to choose. I think Kim and I actually want to work together and have planned this before even coming here to actually look at the connection between the two. But I, I think the best way to do this is to have community data that one can also look at on the kind of program by program level or school by school level and at the individual level. I mean, that's, that's the, I, the ideal. And I think that's where we should, should get to because it's wonderful data. If you just have it, you know, by school, you don't, you can never get to the person who actually needs the services on, mm -hmm. or the group of kids that need certain kind of services and supports. So in terms of the actual accessibility, I mean, the way we typically do this, we work with schools or districts, individual programs, large programs like City Year uh, and others uh, on both training and, and tools and the uh, the tool side of things is about five dollars per kid, so that's mm -hmm. uh, but that includes the training, the kind of doing of the assessments, the sending the assessments to us, the feeding back of the assessments individually and in group versions, and for the programs to then manipulate the data. So training the programs so they can manipulate the data and can actually look at this in the way they want to, or the whole community if it's a, a larger effort. And that actually was one of the, the next set of questions I was going to go to is uh, several people said, do we have to choose between a community or an individual? Do we, you know, what's, are, are this, are this, can the same tool be used in both ways? Um, are the tools actually very different in terms of what, you know, what they're actually asking about and the way they're asking it? Uh, do they have to be developed differently if you want to use it more for the individual level versus the community? And Michael, I didn't know if you'd want to comment on that or, or uh, as well as our guest speakers, but any thoughts? Well, you know, they would ask the non-researcher about tools, but what I will say is that they, the language that we use, the messaging that we want to get out of it has to have a, a common basis of understanding. So 
for, for me to work with a group of clergy or a group of out-of-school time providers and not have the literature available, not have the language that we want parents and uh, youth workers and young people themselves to understand uh, would not be wise. I think children catch on really quickly and uh, in our conversation between, uh, Dr. Riddell was talking about one of his grandchildren coming home and saying that the teacher said he had problems with empathy. Um, how many of our young people can come home and take these categories and find a way to even reach out for the relationships that would help them improve you know, in that space? So whatever the tools are, they have to be commonly accessible, I think, so that we're, you know, we're comparing apples to apples if we use that. And there's so many brands of apples now, and I don't even think that's a good analogy <laughs> as an apple eater. But you know, comparing, comparing the right things to the right things so that we're working for common goals. Yeah, I'll make a, just a quick comment. <clears throat> Selection of a, a measurement tool has to be driven by your need to know and the purpose that you hope to, to put that tool to. Uh, and so, you know, the, the holistic student assessment, I think, is well suited for the purpose for which it was designed. And, and there was the model of intervention, you know, the, the tiered intervention model, I think, has a lot of foundation and a lot of settings. We, we use it in early childhood education. We've got a response to intervention model. Uh, and in order to identify those kids that perhaps need the most intense intervention, then you need, a, you need an assessment that can give you information at the individual level and allow you to identify those with the greatest need. And so the way it's scored and designed and developed, it, it serves that purpose well. If you're really looking for a community, the kind of community mapping of profiles uh, to make much broader, larger policy, perhaps programmatic kind of decisions, it, re it requires a different kind of tool. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, so uh, just uh, help me in thanking the, join me in thanking the panel for their comments. And that. We, we did have a number of other uh, rich questions and I, I'd encourage you to come up and talk to the, the panelists and stuff. I just want to say in closing that um, I'm struck by a number of things. I'm struck by the notion that we actually wrote about a long time ago when we followed a thousand young people growing up in Milwaukee, and we found that the kids who did well had an arena of comfort. For some it might be the school context, for some it's the home context, for some it's the after school program, but they had a place and people relationships that mattered to them and where they could develop and become who they could become and discovered themselves. Um, I'm also struck by the extent to which our speakers particularly talked about uh, the role of data in helping us listen to the voice of young people. Not as the tool to tell the authorities how we're doing, but to listen to the voice of young people letting us know how they're doing, what they need, how we might do it better. Those differences in data as weapon, which we've become too familiar with, and the driving of evidence to make judgments about whether you're succeeding or failing, to moving to a language around data is listening, a tool for us to improve what we do with young people, a tool to stimulate us to do more with young people and a tool to help us understand the difference between what is and what can be.